gloomy night. Hopefully we can lighten your spirits a little bit, although this is a serious topic. The topic, what can we do about climate change, implies that there's something we can do, so I already feel hopeful. My name is Sylvia Stocker. I'm honored to be the minister of this congregation. And I want to let you know a few things before we begin our program. First of all, this program would not even have happened if it weren't for the Durham Friends meeting contacting us with this great idea. So we need to thank them for their idea. Uh, and now I want to turn it over to Ron Turcott, who is our moderator. And we will proceed. Thank you for coming. And uh, it's wonderful to see such a group out here on such a beautiful Friday evening. <laughs> when he came in to uh, talk about a very important topic. Uh, so first of all, I'll explain what we're going to do tonight. We have four speakers, hopefully three are here now. And then uh, they are each going to speak for five minutes uh, after we do a video. But we have a short video of three or four minutes, maybe five, and it's Greta Thunberg, who some of you might have heard of, and she's a remarkable speaker. If you haven't heard her, you're in for a treat. So we'll do that now. My name is Greta Thunberg. I am 15 years old, and I'm from Sweden. I speak on behalf of Climate Justice Now. Many people say that Sweden is just a small country and it doesn't matter what we do. But I've learned that you are never too small to make a difference. And if a few children can get headlines all over the world just by not going to school, then imagine what we could all do together if we really wanted to. But to do that, we have to speak clearly, no matter how uncomfortable that may be. You only speak of green, eternal economic growth because you are too scared of being unpopular. You only talk about moving forward with the same bad ideas that got us into this mess, even when the only sensible thing to do is pull the emergency brake. You are not mature enough to tell it like it is. Even that burden you leave to us children. But I don't care about being popular. I care about climate justice and a living planet. Our civilization is being sacrificed for the opportunity of a very small number of people to continue making enormous amounts of money. Our biosphere is being sacrificed so that rich people in countries like mine can live in luxury. It is the sufferings of the many which pay for the luxuries of the few. The year 2078, I will celebrate my 75th birthday. If I have children, maybe they will spend that day with me. Maybe they will ask me about you. Maybe they will ask why you didn't do anything while there still was time to act. You say you love your children above all else, and yet you are stealing their future in front of their very eyes. Until you start focusing on what needs to be done, rather than what is politically possible, there is no hope. We cannot solve a crisis without treating it as a crisis. We need to keep the fossil fuels in the ground, and we need to focus on equity. And if solutions within this system are so impossible to find, then maybe we should change the system itself. We have not come here to beg world leaders to care. You have ignored us in the past and you will ignore us again. We have run out of excuses and we are running out of time. We have come here to let you know that change is coming, whether you like it or not. The real power belongs to the people. Thank you. Wow. I don't know. How many have never heard Greta speak? 
Wow. First, I, I did. I did. She was on the Democracy Now a few months ago, and I, she addressed. Uh, I don't know if it was this group or another group. Uh, I think it was the, the Climate Summit in Poland, maybe. Yeah, that's what this was. So, uh, but I, I couldn't believe it. Um, not many adults can speak like that. It's quite a challenge. So. Uh, I'll invite our uh, panelists to come on up, if they would, and, and have a seat, and I'll uh, briefly introduce you. But while, while they're coming up, I mentioned uh, we, these little, pretty little lights we have here are called Lucy lights, and they are, they are solar powered, and they're very inexpensive. How much are they a piece? They're $20 a piece, and we have, they are gifts for our panelists. They weigh about, I don't know, an ounce. <laughs> Very light, and it's just a piece of plastic and a little solar panel. And these are being distributed in third world countries. Uh, it's a great idea, a great invention. So, and you can follow along if you like. Uh, Anna Siegel is a 12 year old youth climate activist. She participated with 350 Maine in planning for the April. Day of action. Along with activism, she is deeply passionate about wildlife. She is a seventh grade student at Friends of Portland School. And we have Andy Burke of Down to Earth Storytelling Project. He has nearly three decades of experience creating and directing grassroots programs for social and environmental justice in Maine. She also uses films as tools to promote local action for solutions and advocacy for public policy. She resides in Edgecombe. And we have uh, Sylvia Stocker, Reverend Sylvia Stocker, is here at the UU Church since 2007. The congregation was named a Green Sanctuary by the United, by the Unitarian Universalist Association in 2011. Rebuilding after, after a devastating fire, the congregation paid particular attention to environmentally friendly features including being the first public building in town to install solar panels on the roof. She resides in Brunswick. How about a nice round of applause? <laughs> so I'm, I know we're all very anxious to hear our panels speak now. They will speak for five minutes each side of the panel. Hello, my name is Anna Siegel. I'm a representative of U.S. Team Climate Strikes. 350 Maine, and Maine Youth for Climate Justice. For this panel, I was asked to discuss what my influences were to get involved in climate action. I sat in front of my computer, trying to think out of the box, attempting to go beyond what I say, every interview, article, and question. Alas, I could not. My passion in life is animals. Wildlife is what comes up every time I talk about my activism. The main messages of the youth climate movement, such as, this is our future, we will inherit this earth, didn't dawn on me until after I became involved. In the beginning, it was always about the birds, the forest creatures, the insects. Every day, I read the news and the panic deep in my gut dug in a little deeper. In sixth grade, I had my why for becoming an activist. Headlines like, we are entering the sixth wave of mass extinction were always in my head. Soon enough, I had my how. My teacher, Lee Chisholm, incredibly supportive and a fantastic mentor, he gave me the opportunities I needed introduced me to 350 Maine and urged me to reach out to U.S. Youth Climate Strikes. He and other fantastic youth and adult organizers alike have helped me through this entire process. Now, the panic I've always felt is more of a dull ache. It's cliche, but I believe I've found a voice. On March 15th, 
youth around the world found their own voices. On the day of the global strike for climate, the children took the world by storm. I was just one of 1.4 million youth out on the streets. The United States was only one of over 120 countries where an uncountable number of strikes were held. I hope that we rattled politicians, just as I was rattled to hear the IPCC report last autumn. That report was my second significant influence to take action and made the issue of climate change personal. As you may know, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change stated that we, humanity itself, have 12 years to put the brakes on catastrophic carbon emissions. 12 years is my entire lifetime. It put a new lens on my life, my future, the world, but contrary to two years ago, where I was scared and felt helpless, the report wasn't devastating. It didn't hit so hard because I'm doing something. No matter how small I might be, how effective anything I do is, or whether I matter, I am doing something. After March 15th, there was a quiet. A month of networking and hard work had paid off in around 800 kids rallying in Portland. Now what? My friends and fellow members of our middle school climate action team provided an answer. They wanted to strike again. If any one of you happens to drive by Monument Square next Friday, you'll see a small group of students, two or ten, holding signs, chanting, talking to the passerby, you'll see us there all day. And the Friday after that, then the next one. I hope that one day, I'll ask my own kids what influences them to fight for their beliefs. Even more so than I wish for them to say the animals, the natural world, the earth, I hope they say it was me. Thank you. Scientists and youth like Greta and Anna are telling us we've got 12 years to act boldly to address the climate crisis and biodiversity collapse. This means transformative changes in behavior, including how we consume energy, food and water, and how we use land and technology. With just five minutes, I hope I can share some thoughts about how we can most effectively embrace transformative changes as we begin the countdown. At the core, I believe we must adopt a spiritual or mindfulness practice where we each strive to divest from our polluting behaviors and invest in healthier practices, reduce our roles as carbon emitters and increase our roles as a carbon sink in our personal circle of influence on the Earth's well-being. And we build a kinship relationship to the natural world around us. Let me briefly describe what I mean. Imagine your own body as the innermost circle with a direct relationship to the Earth and consider the transformative changes you might make. I will suggest just a few. Changing our food habits is one of the most effective ways to reduce our footprint. In the book, Drawdown, a uh, New York Times bestseller, divesting from meat, changing to a plant-rich diet, is ranked fourth as a climate solution. Reducing food waste is ranked third. With this summer's bounty now upon us, this provides a great time to transition to eating less meat and finding ways to waste less food. And while you are upping your commitment to these actions, 
you can know that the state is considering public policy that will move leftover foods from institutions to hungry people first, then farm animals, then to compost, and finally to, uh, to trash to energy as a last resort. It's a win-win situation all around. Shop mindfully. Pause for a moment to consider the life cycle of packaging and food miles traveled before you take that item off the shelf. Plastic pollution has been named as one of the five major contributors to the accelerating extinction of wildlife. Getting plastic out of our lives is a difficult task. But for example, local plastic bag bans in 20 main communities seeded legislation for a statewide plastic bag ban this year. The bills are still under consideration. And Rising Tide, a co-op just up the road in Damerscada, is modeling how to get plastic and unnecessary packaging out of a grocery store, offering cash rewards to customers who bring their own containers. The next circle you could consider is your home. Divest from fossil fuels use and invest in weatherizing and installing energy efficient technologies, light and heat your home with renewables. This can mean buying green energy from your utility, putting solar on your home or your congregation, or investing in a solar farm. Divest your lawn and invest in carbon sequestering solutions. Gardens filled with perennials, herbs, and vegetables, native plants that attract pollinators or create habitat for creatures such as reptiles, amphibians, birds, and other endangered wildlife. Here's an interesting fact. Lawns are the single largest crop in the US, covering 32 million acres. Converting lawns to gardens or orchards would add to local food supplies and create more effective carbon sinks. By the way, we use 16 million acres to grow the food we eat today. The next circle represents transportation, which in Maine is a major contributor to our collective emissions profile. But there's encouraging news. Many young people today are choosing to live in urban settings where they don't own a car and can walk or bicycle or to get around. Electric vehicle charging stations are sprouting up all across Maine, and interest is growing in light rail and other forms of public transportation. And now imagine your own circles touching other people's circles to become a divested, invested community nation and earth. One by one, we've created transformation revolution. Where are the opportunities for your town to divest and invest? Local communities are today's engines for change. They will also be the foundation for adapting to the challenging impacts that climate change and biodiversity loss are, will present to us. And here are a few opportunities to throw into the pot, ideas for how, what you might find in your community for transformation. First of all, check the climate, whether climate change considerations are built into your comprehensive plan. Follow York, Maine, and sign up for Sierra Club's Ready for 100 campaign that is rapidly transitioning more than 100 cities and towns across the country to renewable power. Organize activities that bring diverse members of the community together. Window dressers, interior storm window builds, with at least a third of the, of the windows going to low income. Mainers, build bulk purchasing campaigns through Efficiency Maine for weatherization, heat pumps, solar PV, tree planting, garden builds. Make a film 
this is, I'm self-serving with this, <laughs> make a film that documents climate solutions already visible in your town, as well as sites that present possibilities for new solutions. The result would be a tool that's inspiring to your neighbors and perhaps to your town council. A great classroom uh, activity or a faith community project for all ages. The world's 370 million indigenous peoples make up less than 5% of the total human population. The recent report on biodiversity suggests that we look to them for our, our future. They, this population, the 370 million, manage or hold tenure over 25% of the world's land surface and support about 80% of the global biodiversity. We must look to them for knowledge and embrace their kinship approach to the earth and her ecosystems. The future of our planet lies in indigenous ways of living on the earth. Indigenous peoples have mastered the art of living on the earth without destroying it. They continue to teach and lead by example. We must heed their lessons and take on this challenging task if we want our grandchildren to have a future. I've been asked to address the question, what can we do about climate change from a spiritual angle? What does this mean to us spiritually? And that's a hard question to answer in a group of people that probably represents a very diverse range of spirituality, spiritual practices. Some of us may even not relate very well to the word spiritual itself. So. Um, I'm going to draw on something that I often draw on, and that is the work of Joanna Macy, who is an eco-activist. And she teaches what she calls the circle of reflection. And I think that this really, her circle of reflection can apply to anyone, regardless of your own um, religion, your own spiritual practices. Her spiritual, her um, spiral of reflection, her circle of reflection, has four points in it. You enter into the spiral at the first step by expressing gratitude. And probably most of us can name some things that we're grateful for. What are some of the things that you're grateful for? Just check them out. Life. Family. 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 Water. There were many things. They came at me all at once. I couldn't hear them all. Um, grateful for um, me, grateful for opportunities like this where the community can gather. We start with gratitude to ground ourselves in our hearts, the things that feed us, that nurture us. And then the second point in the spiral of reflection is to name or honor, not name, both name, but really to honor our pain. And I bet that there are a lot of burdens that people are carrying, either about the planet or personal burdens. Um, what are some of the things that people are carrying? I know for me the, the latest news about um, habitat loss and the projected loss of millions um, of life forms on the planet going extinct at a much higher rate. That's one thing I carry. Any anyone else want to shout something out? I'm at refugees. Refugees. Pollution. Pollution. War. War. Poverty. Shootings in schools. Mm -hmm. Say again. Shootings in school schools. School shootings. School, school shootings. Resignation or cynicism. Cynicism, resignation. Racism. 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 Chemicals in the food supply. Chemicals in the food supply. So many things. 
so many things. If we were in a Joanna Macy workshop, we would be spending like entire days on each of these. So I'm really, this is a, this is a breezing through something. Um, from honoring our pain, we go to seeing with new eyes. And here, um, once we've named our gratitude, honored our pain, there's an opportunity to open up. Um, because Joanna teaches, this is a great quote for her, she says the heart that breaks open can contain the whole universe. And if we made our gratitude and our pain and opened our hearts, even if they feel broken, from that place, because we've opened up our hearts, we can access our creativity, our compassion, our passion, um, and we enter into a period of being able to um, think of new ideas and maybe naming some of the things in our community that are new, ideas that, that are already here that need to be acted on, some of the things that the other panelists have already talked about. Um, Joanna also talks about when we um, see with new eyes that it's important to honor the ancestors who brought us here 30,000, I think it is, 30,000, roughly, generations of human beings have brought us to this place tonight. 30,000 human beings living through um, sickness, through hunger, through war, through displacement, through all kinds of things through the centuries to bring us here, to give us life so that we can do what we need to do. And she also talks about um, in this portion of the spiral of reflection, she talks about thinking of the future beings who might someday look back. Uh, Greta talked about that actually in her, her video a little bit. But imagining 100 years from now, 200 years, imagine that you could speak to those future beings and ask them questions about their lives. And maybe Imagine what questions they might have for us about our lives. And that kind of imagining can shift things in our own existence here today. And then the last portion of the spiral of reflection is what she calls going forth or sending forth. And this is where we, we leave the spiral going back into the world energized. And I want to read some, some words that to me represent this part of the spiral of reflection. They come from Bernadette R. Burns. And she writes, from, for the joyful, may jubilant songs echo in our hearts well beyond fading memories. For the sorrowful, May gentle songs of solace bring lasting healing to our hearts and minds. For the angry, may we join our voices together in songs of protest and hope. For the mindful, may we sing the praises of Earth's beauty and honor the unique songs of all beings. For all of us here in community and our world, May we sing to the morning and evening stars as they guide our journeys. So there is a lot more to be said about um, addressing this from a spiritual angle. And there isn't a lot of time, and Brownie just walked in. So. <laughs> We'll have to take one breath, okay? <laughs> well, thank you very much. Our final speaker, thank you for being here. You had perfect time. Senator Brownie Carson, uh, Democrat from Huntsville, represents the communities of Brunswick, Freeport, North Yarmouth, Powell, and his hometown of, town of Huntsville. 
a Vietnam veteran, attorney, and environmental active advocate. He is dedicated to improving the lives of people throughout Maine. He was executive director of the Natural Resources Council of Maine for 27 years. And we will now hear from Brownie. So as you catch your breath and have a drink of water, thank you. Well, I do want to apologize for being late. Um, I was, I think the phrase is unavoidably detained. <laughs> the criminal justice, that, that is, in Augusta at the State House. Um, <laughs> should I say not in the Kennebec County Jail? I'm not sure exactly how to. Um, the criminal justice committee started hearings this morning at 9 o'clock on 11 different gun safety bills, ranging from background checks to a ban on the sale of high capacity magazines to the bill for which, or of which I'm the prime sponsor, lead sponsor, um, to require a 72 hour waiting period between buying a gun and actually taking possession of it. Um, and the last bill that was partially being heard when I left was the so-called Stand Your Ground bill um, that obviously leapt into the news, I think, as a result of the Florida case of Trayvon Martin. Um, it's really, it's a little hard to jump into the middle of a gathering like this um, without the context of having heard the other speakers. Um, I actually stayed a little longer than I, I wanted to stay to testify, although it is possible simply to leave your written testimony with the committee, but there were many, many um, people in camouflage and in NRA Orange who were talking um, strongly, shall we say, about the Second Amendment and, and, and gun rights. Um, in absolute terms, in terms that almost in a very real sense deny the fact that we live in communities in a civilized society, we hope. Um, talking in terms of the, the, the need for personal protection, um, whether it via uh, possession and use of an AR-15, I mean it, it's in some ways, it's, it's, almost, it's almost another universe. And one of the, in fact, the greatest joy for me of being, and I know it's a leap to say it from what I just said to the greatest joy, but, but um, serving in the legislature in the state senate as I do from this area, from the communities uh, in Senate District 24, Harpsville, Brunswick, Freeport, North Yarmouth, and Powell is that there is such a broad, strong, and vibrant community of people who care so very deeply about human rights, about public health, about educating our children, about protecting the environment, about so many things that are really, really important for the future. And the change in atmospherics in the, in the political climate in Augusta. There are still Republicans and Independents and Democrats, but there is, notwithstanding my brief description of the, of the gun safety hearings, which is almost in its own separate world, actually, there's the gun safety or gun rights world, there's the vaccination for public health and the so-called anti-vax world, and then there's the rest of political dialogue and, and debate in Augusta, which is really pretty sensible, pretty straightforward. We don't always agree with each other, but in the Environment Committee, uh, which, of which I'm co-chair, Ralph Tucker, also from Brunswick, as you know, is the, is the other co-chair. You know, we are going to become the first state in the country, we have in fact become the first state in the country to ban the sale of single-use styrofoam uh, containers. Uh, yeah. 
we are working on what are called product stewardship bills. And I love the term product stewardship because the theory, of course, is of product stewardship, uh, another name for which is uh, extended producer responsibility, is that when a business or a manufacturer puts a product, a thing, into commerce, they actually bear some responsibility alongside consumers and alongside those who manage its useful life. But they really bear some of the responsibility. And we've been debating, um, for instance, um, a product stewardship program for um, pharmaceuticals and, and, and over-the-counter over drugs. We're calling it the drug take-back bill. And it would involve pharmaceutical manufacturers, the big ones like Merck and uh, Abbott Labs and so forth, as well as the makers of generics and the makers of the, the bare aspirins, accept some responsibility for their stewardship of their product, whether it ends up in somewhat large amounts uh, in the home of an elderly person who maybe is getting drugs by mail or or just continuing to receive prescriptions and not taking them all, or they just, they built up. What do, what, what do, we, what do we do with those? And the idea behind this particular um, product stewardship program is that there be, uh, to start with kiosks in not every single pharmacy, not every single neighborhood pharmacy, but for instance, in all the Walgreens and Rite Aids, which I guess doesn't exist anymore, but the, but the other, Oscos, Oscos, and the Hannaford pharmacies where people can come and just take these drugs back safely and other steps, including safe mail back and so forth, so that these things don't get into our water courses by being flushed down the toilets and, and thus poisoning, in a sense, or changing the, the, uh, the character of our water courses. Um, the, there, are, there are proposals for mattress uh, stewardship programs for uh, batteries, both rechargeable and not. We have these programs for paint. Um, we have them for, for uh, uh, mercury-containing lamps. We have them for mercury-containing thermostats. So those kinds of discussions, I realize I'm wandering a bit, but I'm afraid I'm pretty tired. Um, those kinds of discussions really integrate what are our what are our human, our corporate, et cetera, responsibilities, and how are we going to allocate those? And they're and they're very engaging, and, and I think we're we're really we're really making some some progress there. On the bigger issue, and I'm sure you've probably touched on climate change and and uh, um, those kinds of some of those global issues. Um, as I'm sure you know, the governor has proposed Maine's first climate council. Um, we had some bills earlier in the session at the Environment Committee about what is our, what are our goals going to be? Are we going to reduce by X percent by Y year? And the one we've pretty much settled on is uh, an 80 percent that is below 1990 levels, which are much bigger than today's, but 80 percent below 1990 levels by the year 2050, and there's some interim goals. There was some energy and advocacy behind an 80% reduction below, again, 1990 levels by 2030. And if many of us, myself included, really wanted that, but we also didn't want, and this is where the dialogue got very interesting, we didn't want to set a goal that was so ambitious and such a huge stretch that we failed, or we risked failure, and then where are we and, and what are the, uh, What are the responses of people who started out as skeptics, but whom we hope that we can bring along through even more aggressive energy efficiency programs, even more after eight years of a governor who didn't believe in clean renewables, frankly, um, getting, uh, and there's some, a number of people from Brunswick who are really working on the solar issue. Um, there's there's uh, offshore wind after starting and then stopping um, is now, underway again, it's certainly in the exploratory phases. That hasn't actually been a legislative issue, but the energy behind clean renewables and energy efficiency and, um, and the reduction of greenhouse gases 
uh, in every, I mean, it's in transportation, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's in our home heating, and if we can, if we can clean up our electrical uh, production system in New England and in the larger, of course, across the country, then theoretically we can convert from oil heat, which is inefficient and fairly dirty, to heat pumps that are electrically uh, powered. But that's, that's a real leap. And I don't know how many of you all are following or engaged in the issue of whether or not the so-called New England Clean Energy Connect power line, the one that for to bring Hydro Quebec, proposed to bring Hydro Quebec hydroelectric power down through Maine, particularly through western Maine, down to Massachusetts. Um, and there's, there's so many issues that are unknown about this power line. You would think hydroelectric power made from dams and, and, and the rivers to Massachusetts would be a good thing, but there are wrinkles in it galore. And CMP, who stands to make 60 or $80 million a year from the project in Hydro-Quebec, which is going to make billions, have left, in my judgment, a very, very incomplete record. So I'm asking through legislation, it's called LD640, that we do a, a verification, that we do an analysis and try to get uh, more verified facts. And that bill, hotly contested in some quarters, actually cleared the Senate yesterday on its first vote by 30 votes in favor and four votes. <laughs> There are many other, many other things I could say. I think, I think your standing was probably <laughs> hit that I should be quiet. And I look forward to participating, um, answering questions and participating with the panel. And I apologize if I talk too long. It's just, there's so much to tell you all. Thank you very much, Cassidy, as a board member for Portland. Um, we're organizing a show that was inspired by the youth movement um, in Portland in 1989. And my question for the panel is, Who's doing the most comprehensive plan for addressing climate in Maine? I'd love to be able to tell the people who are brave enough to come to this show and be open and to learn um, how they can become involved because to throw all of this at people without giving them a way to act and become involved just seems like a lost opportunity. Thanks. Can you say the question again? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear it. Who is doing the most at comprehensive uh, plan for addressing climate in Maine? And if not in Maine, then in the U.S. And if not in the U.S., then worldwide. Um, because I'd like to tap into those resources and build community um, using, we're, we're all kind of blind, blind them at the elephant. Heard that parable. Um, and so an over, overarching plan would be a wonderful thing to have revealed. I don't know if Drawdown has inspired any um, comprehensive plans, but I'd like to see them. Um, so I believe that the most comprehensive plan going to the U.S. Uh, is the Green New Deal that was introduced by um, Senator Ed Markey and uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And that, it, the Green New Deal is fully endorsed by Sunrise, which is a youth movement largely started by colleges. Um, they stormed Nancy Pelosi's office, office. You may have seen the videos and photos of the youth lining her hallway with these signs. And in only six months, they brought the Green New Deal in the national spotlight. It went from an idea, and now they're doing a tour around the US talking to people about it. It's incredible. Uh, I think it's the most comprehensive plan because it takes all the issues hand in hand. Climate justice, a just transition, economics, clean energy, conservation. Because the issue of the environment, it's not just the environment. It's not just about the trees. It's about our world at large and how what we put in the air affects everything that the air wraps around. And that's what, So I believe the Green New Deal is the most comprehensive climate plan for the U.S. For the state of Maine, um, 
Chloe Maxman introduced a main Green New Deal, and it focuses largely on a just transition, making sure that transition clean energy is fair for all Mainers. So I believe that is a good and strong plan paired with other legislation that might be more ambitious with other goals. Thank you.